And all right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm Josiah Neely. I am the Texas director and a senior fellow with the R Street Institute. Um, we are here today to have yet another panel about uh, the Texas blackouts. Um, uh, this, I, there's a lot of uh, stuff, activity going on at the legislature right now as we enter the home stretch of the Texas legislative session. Uh, about, uh, by my account, uh, six weeks left uh, till Memorial Day, give or take. Um, there has been, you know, uh, unsurprisingly, the February blackouts have uh, spurred a wide variety of legislative proposals. Um, all sorts of stuff is making its way through the legislature and hearings and in debates and in uh, the public. So we're gonna talk about it. Uh, we have with us a distinguished panel. Uh, so uh, first, we have uh, Pat Wood, a uh, former FERC chair, former Texas PUC chair, the CEO of uh, Hunt Energy. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Katie Coleman, who is an attorney with the Thompson Knight, also represents uh, TIC, the Texas Industrial Energy Consumers, in Industrial Energy Consumers, yeah, not, not electric. And uh, we also have Beth Garza, who is a senior fellow with R Street and uh, in a prior life was uh, the director for ERCOT's Independent Market Monitor. So uh, we have a, you know, we, we could, there's, there's enough uh, potential topics here for us to talk for, for a long, long time. Uh, I will say, you know, for people who are in the audience, uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A and we will feed those in there uh, as well. But just to start, I just want to start with kind of a, a general, uh, general question, which is, you know, the ERCOT, the ERCOT market is obviously, it's unique in the United States in terms of its market structure. And so perhaps under, unsurprisingly, the outages uh, and, uh, per, you know, lack of performance of the system in February has led a lot of people to say, well, th th there needs to be some sort of uh, market overhaul. And there's, there's been a bunch of different proposals of what that could be. Um, I am interested in hearing from the panelists what they think about, uh, you know, what, what are the, how do they feel about the current Texas market design and ERCOT? What sort of changes do they think need to be made? Do they think the system is fundamentally sound? Um, Pat, uh, let's start with you because you were, you know, uh, very involved in the history of uh, the, the current system and you have a lot of uh, thoughts on it from the state and national level. So what, what are you thinking? You know, when we set it up in 99, it, it's interesting to have the debate now, because I went to FERC, um, you know, two years later and got thrown into the mix of capacity market arguments at uh, PJM and ISO and a little bit in New York's capacity market. We had issues really in the first 18 months, not to mention California with its lack of any sort of resource adequacy mechanism. So, you know, when I left here, I was like, I don't even understand what that is. I mean, capacity, it's like energy market just seemed like the default. We didn't have really what I considered a robust debate about that because we really didn't think about any uh, alternative on resource adequacy. We were at, I remember at the time, uh, 98 was a really tight summer. Um, and I, I had a certain governor of Texas let me know that he was up for reelection that fall. So we <laughs> didn't try to not have anything happen this summer. So we actually did in, in January and February of that year, put in a lot of, uh, at that time, regulatory proposals to manage demand, increase energy efficiency and, and create some uh, excess generation. So that a lot of the cataloging of all the miscellaneous generation started back in the summer of 98. But anyway, that haven't been said. We didn't, we didn't, we saw, uh, and oh, by the time 01 happened, we had a lot of announcements of new still on the ground from the new combined cycle gas generators, Calpine and others. And we dealt with, the, you know, looking for the next 10 years, it was this huge oversupply of, of power. In fact, that resulted in 
a lot of the more inefficient plants shutting down in the past few years. So, you know, that issue wasn't teed up here. We did have it after the 2011, and I actually did with uh, Julie Parsley and John Paul Oxter come out with an editorial at Governor Perry's request to support Donna Nelson as she was uh, considering entering, uh, introducing a capacity construct. I wouldn't say certainly nothing as robust as PJM, but what they were talking about in response to what looked like uh, closing margins in the mid part of the decade last, you know, back in 2013. I reluctantly said, you know, I'd rather not throw the whole baby out uh, for lack of a capacity market. So, you know, wasn't a passion for me, but seemed like a uh, maybe a bridge to a more robust future when we did have storage, when we did have demand response, and you really didn't have the issues with that, that we saw last month because we aren't quite over that bridge yet. I would have been okay with one. I, I can't think that it would have made any difference in this particular episode. So. Uh, the capacity market debate is worth having. It's, I think, as Chairman Patty over in the House said, let's have that debate, but not so passionately. Let's have it in, in, in due time. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what he said, but you know, um, I don't. A capacity market really is a substitute for an improperly functioning retail market, and we don't despite what happened last month, we don't have an improperly functioning retail market. Uh, now, if it gets too aggregated and there's too much market power, and I'd love best thoughts on that later in the discussion, but you know, I think you, if you don't have the incentive to procure power in the Texas market um, to, to buy forward, you don't have it anywhere. So I, I don't know that the capacity market issue is something we ought to you know, twist our swords off over. What we do need to think about, and it's one we never have talked about, is what kind of market structure do we have in, in, a, in a world, which we're fast coming to, probably Texas first more than anywhere else in the world, where more than 50% of the hours are gonna be cleared by zero variable cost, zero cost variable resources. When wind and solar make up the half of the hours of the year or more, when you're clearing an energy market price at zero or with the subsidies on wind continuing for another 10 or 20 years below zero, um, that's, gonna, that's gonna cause the train to fall off the track. So we're gonna have to think about what is a different way to buy power uh, or maybe a different way to clear the price for power. There's always gonna be bilateral contracts. In fact, that probably where we go more and more, but um, which is good, uh, but I, you know that's uh, Josiah. I think I think um, market design issues are needed. I don't know that the market design issues are the core of the solution to what happened last month, uh, but they're ones that are going to be that are that are triggered by what's happening in the broader market which is the increase of renewables in Texas, regardless of the towel snaps and the welcome mat trying to get yanked out and all that stuff, renewables are here to stay. God gave us too much wind and solar for us not to learn how to make money off of it. And we've learned how to make money off of it. So that ain't changing. So we've got to make sure we've got a healthy structure in place to accommodate that, which I don't think the current structure is. Uh, I do want to uh, come back to the renewables issue in a, in a minute, but uh, first, Beth, so we know, you know, there, there has been talk of the capacity market. There's also, in fact, we've already got a question about it in the chat. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway has its own proposal uh, that they're going to build a bunch of their own cost recovery power plants and, you know, they will swoop in in an emergency to save us all. What do you what do you think about all this? Well, my my glib answer is, you know, uh, old Warren Buffett knows how to how to extract uh, monopoly rents in a variety of industries. <laughs> and here's another example. Um, I think uh, it, it, you know, I, I don't like the proposal. Just let me be very clear about it. Um, I think this combination of or what they describe as a set aside regulatory asset doesn't work and will interfere with the market. Um, and that's a bad thing. We can have a market or we can have regulation. And when we try to do both um, in terms of pricing and supply, I think 
things get off the rails. And so that's what concerns me about, uh, about the proposal. Um, I, you know, at some level, I'm, th you know, I, I, I credit to the Berkshire Hathaway uh, energy folks who, who have thought about it and have a good idea. Um, frankly, I'm not sure we need another 10 gigawatts of gas generation on the ground maybe what we need is just their LNG storage at a variety of locations around the state. And so I, you know, that would be a question that I would ask them is what does that cost? Is that $8.3 billion or is that something less? Presumably um, less since. Yeah, presumably something less. I'm concerned about. I'm concerned that, um, uh, that clearly in the contest, you know, markets are messy, right? Com competition is messy. Um, you're not quite sure what the answer is going to be. You're not quite sure what pe how people are going to react to the various incentives. And that uncertainty, I understand, is troubling. If I were a legislator, I would be legislator. I would be troubled as well. Um, and so this idea of I want to be able to control, I want to be able to know what the answer is. Um, well, we sort of did that in regulation, um, and uh, and I'm going to tee Katie up for this one because I, I heard her I heard her sort of make an aside the other day where uh, she would prefer regulation versus an installed capacity market, and and I'd go I, I, I differ with her on that on that, and but I would say I would prefer regulation versus full regulation versus Berkshire Hathaway's proposal laid on top of what we currently have as a market structure. All right, so Katie, let's let's go to that. You're you're uh, you're coming out for regulation, is that right? Yeah, it's so. hard for me to sit here and not jump in. <laughs> um, let, her let her go. <laughs> well, you know, first off, you know, when I get asked what happened, I always say at the legislature, I always say, "Well, you need to call Pat. He designed this mess." <laughs> Um, but, I, you know, I agree with much of what's been said about, you know, we're always open to having discussions about market design, uh, but I, we fundamentally believe that the market has actually worked really, really well. We have had better reliability than most of the country for a lower cost. We have actually never had what I would consider a true capacity event. Most of our events, all of our events have really been operational issues. And so we just fundamentally don't believe that requiring customers to buy power plants in whatever form that takes is warranted. It's really about making sure that the fleet you have has the right operational characteristics for a wide variety of circumstances. Um, I do very much agree with Pat that the amount of renewables on the system has made it difficult um, to withstand some of these operational issues. So for example, you know, we've had situations in the summer where depending on whether the renewables showed up or didn't, the reserve margin might effectively be 17% or 2%. Um, and you're not getting thermal investment because of the pricing impacts you talked about, you know, the thermal show, the uh, renewables show up most of the time, crush prices, and then the one time they don't, we have a big problem. I think that is a big design issue that we need to try to figure out how to address. Um, and not in a way that's punitive to renewables. We, the, there's a place for everybody here, but there's got to be some way to, to manage those reliability impacts because they're very real. And, and I think that's the biggest issue that the system is facing. Um, but with respect to my statement about about preferring re-regulation. So when we deregulated, the benefit of the bargain for customers was um, we were going to pay a clearing price for all energy produced, um, but in exchange, we weren't going to have to buy power plants. That is an acceptable framework for us. Regulation, by contrast, we do buy power plants, but we get them at cost, and then we get the power they produce at cost. So either of those, you know, obviously there's some, there's some benefits in terms of flexibility, tailoring your own risk and supply and all that to a competitive market that we very much support. Um, but from a, from a pure cost standpoint, a capacity market is really the worst of both constructs because we pay a clearing price for power plants that we are forced to buy every single year. And we pay the same price for a megawatt of 
new gas or whatever it is that you want to buy as we do for a coal plant in the 70s that probably should retire. Um, and then we still don't get any of the power it costs. We're paying a clearing price for power. And if you want performance, you want that clearing price to be um, adequate to compel people to show up. And so you're really not looking at a much lower clearing price, in my opinion, than what we already have. So from a consumer standpoint, um, we, we believe that the best path forward here is to look at some of the emerging issues within our current market design and not be looking at these constructs that force us to buy power plants. All right. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the renewables issue because uh, one, you know, measure that's provoked a, a, a certain amount of controversy has to do with uh, shifting or adding uh, so ancillary services costs or other costs on to renewable energy to kind of, uh, account for costs that they're adding to the grid, uh, supposedly, or other things like that. Uh, what, what is y'all's perspective on that? Uh, Pat, do you, I know that you followed this a little bit and Beth as well, but. Yeah, I'll... I, I, um, I got this interesting, let me just project something on the screen here because I saw this, uh, helpful piece of data that came in from my friend that runs the Texas synchronized synchro synchro condenser group. But anyway, this is just a quick stick. Did this show on your screen real well? Uh, I can see it. Okay. So what it is, is just basically showing where, uh, the, where the generation has been the last two weeks. So this is kind of the quiet weeks. Um, and this would, this is, uh, I think that's cut off on the bottom, but this right here where my cursor is, is the 11th through, uh, through yesterday. So this shows the, the green line basically is wind plus solar. So you see that at, it was at 50, which is more way over the demand, uh, the, total, the total of everything else. But what's happened is, is with the seasonal maintenance going on now, all the, mo most of the, a majority of the fossil fleet is offline. And so I think Katie said this eloquently a minute ago, when it's there, it's crushing the price. Or maybe Beth said that when, it's, when, when these renewable resources are there, you know, with bidding in zero or, or taking, you know, basically bidding in whatever to run, they're, they're, they're crushing the price. But here, the last, those two days when ERCOT called a conservation alert is we've got, we've got this going on here. So I, I, I it couldn't have come at a worse time for renewables because we've got all the more plants than normal down for maintenance. And then the, the wind dropped off in the season when we generally have had it. But you know, it's a variable resource. And I think we've got to get smart, just like we did. People always forget we had a 2004 blackout, um, uh, short one. I'm not sure it was a full rolling blackout or not, but due to wind, uh, the errors in wind forecasting. And then ERCOT got really good at wind forecasting and we haven't had that issue again. They kind of telegraphed that this was coming. Uh, it was in the day ahead market, not quite the to the extent it was yesterday or two days ago. But in any event, the renew the the variability of the renewable resource is just something we're going to have to get good at, just like we did after 2004. So I'm not worried that we won't do it. I'm just again, as as I think your question indicated, a little worried about the that the investment signal, which has been so strong since a bipartisan legislature under Bush and that era and, and subsequent. I mean, it wasn't just Bush, it was Perry. It was wonderful with the CREZ project was just a game changer nationally. And in fact, people are still calling me from foreign countries, asking them about the CREZ. I'm like, just do grid-wide planning and get the shit built. I mean, it's not really hard. There's not a 10 day seminar I need to run on building transmission, but it just takes moxie and vision to do it. And the legislature did it in response to, um, you know, a kind of bipartisan need out in West Texas to, if you build it, they will come. So that was a very big welcome mat that has been uh, splayed out of Texas for the past two decades. And I hate to see, I hate to see that get rolled back in, but you know, we're all adults here and the right investments will be made. So uh, as long as we avoid truly bad policies, um, which, you know, are always on the, on the horizon, um, we, uh, we should be okay um, managing all of the above because we've got to have all of the above. I think that's one thing that even though I'm kind of viewed as a strong renewable advocate <laughs> for whatever reason in my history, I, I have to say sitting here in the dark for three days, it really made me 
want to do whatever we could to make sure that's still in the ground is here. Maybe not used near as much for carbon purposes as we want it, but I'd sure want it here um, and generating power on those days when the wind's not blowing and uh, or on the nights when there's no solar and the batteries are have expended. So. All right. Well, and, and Beth, what, what do you think? I know ancillary services is, a, is an issue that a lot of people, uh, their eyes kind of glaze over a little bit. Exactly. Uh, or you kind of get that, that scared, you know, panicked look in the, behind the eyes. But so what, what are your yeah. thoughts? I, I uh, you know, I've been a, a, the, the question of shouldn't, should we allocate costs of ancillary services to intermittent resources has been a topic uh, discussed often through the years. And I've, I've consistently been an advocate against that. I think that when costs are incurred, they are best borne directly by customers and, and they pay the direct cost, not a generator's risk assessment of what those costs might be. That's, that's been my philosophy and I continue to hold with that. Um, that said, you know, I, I, I could get, I, it wouldn't be crushing, it wouldn't be terrible if, if we wanted to take just the ancillary service costs and roll in wind or wind and intermittent generation as part of the, the denominator over which we spread those costs. That certainly can be done. I, I would not advocate for it. Is it the end of the world if that were to happen? No. What, would concern, what does concern me is the specific legislative language that is proposed and it has, you know, assigned ancillary service costs and replacement power costs. And I don't know what that second piece means. And so it's hard to understand what the objective, when you don't understand what the objective is, it's hard to come up with a rational way to, to deal with it. So, you know, Pat, Pat rattled on for a little while. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick up on one of his, on one of his trails in terms of, of CREZ and the, you know, much, there were some comments made about how, uh, you know, we've done a lot for wind and, and renewables. We spent, you know, $7 billion on transmission. You know what, though, that $7 million or $7 billion of transmission was, uh, was in some respects, a part, part of that at least was an enabler for the big load growth that we have seen in far west Texas with the increased oil and gas drilling. And that to me has really kind of highlighted, you know, transmission really is the enabler. And, and I'm listening to other people in other markets concerned about we shouldn't be investing in tra transmissions expensive. Yeah, and maybe in a, it's anything talking about hundreds of millions or billions of dollars is expensive, but compared to the, um, to the benefits that it brings yep. is, is small. And the and I'm and this concern over well we don't want to spend all this money for something that may not be useful and I'm hard pressed to figure out how could any transmission that is inter you know part of the overall network not at some level be valuable and useful um, and and so and given that we can never forecast it, it, with accuracy what's going to happen 20 years from now just having the most robust network to pass electricity around um, seems to be in everybody's best interest. Um, but that's, a, that's really a, a, a transmission tangent. Than, um, uh, and I know Katie's not gonna like any of that, uh, <laughs> but that's, she can, she's more than, more than capable, more than capable of speaking for herself on those issues. <laughs> yes, Katie, did you have anything that uh, you wanted to respond on all this? Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I guess there's a couple different issues there. So um, I don't, you know, I don't know the answer on the renewable stuff. I, I think we are under a lot of pressure to try to put some words around it this session. And I think what you see moving is an effort to say something but not be too specific. Because, you know, when we've had conversations about this, ideally, we would want this to be some kind of adaptable um, standard that would apply to renewables that they could find ways to 
behave their way out of through technological advances or you know potentially financial hedging. Um, we don't want it to just be a penalty to no end, right? The objective is not just to penalize these guys, but to try to create an incentive to have more reliability and predictability around what these resources are going to provide. So, you know, I can't sit here and tell you what replacement power means in that statute. I don't think anybody knows, but I will say that I think the general consensus is that it is not really meant to uh, just rehash this discussion about allocating ancillary service, existing ancillary services to renewables. I think the idea is that ERCOT is going to procure some additional firming capacity to try to back up that wind variability and that they're going to bear at least some of those costs. Um, and whether that ends up being done on kind of a uh, system-wide basis with, you know, a discussion about how to allocate it or whether it's done as, as an individual responsibility, um, I think that those are all discussions that we're going to have to have. But I think the idea is, you know, trying to have some accountability around what we can expect from them. That's one approach. I think another possible approach, and, you know, much of this doesn't need to be done at the legislature. Um, I think another approach that's been discussed is we have a lot of bells and whistles in our market design that are really designed to incentivize reserves and investment in reserves and renewables don't really provide reserves and yet we're paying those price components to them. Um, and a lot of our scarcity pricing features, you can question whether there really should be some kind of bifurcated uh, clearing price. And I think that's something that merits further exp further exploration. I do think, you know, it's it sounds complicated to me, and I think there's a high potential for unintended consequences there. Um, but but I think those are the things that we need to at least look at. And, and I've said this over and over, but I'll say it again, because this is a new audience. Uh, you know, our members very much value renewables. We have lots of, uh, you know, companies that are pursuing zero carbon initiatives. They contract with wind, with solar. A lot of them actually are putting solar on site behind their meter. So we want those resources to thrive, but not in a way that compromises the integrity of our market. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the transmission issues for now so we can <laughs> get to other topics. You know I guess what? I'll say real quick on the transmission issues. We love transmission. We think that transmission is a, the key to a robust market. But the problem is with the load growth that we have had in the state, um, it becomes a matter of priority. There are limited resources to devote to that. And so we, we prefer to prioritize projects that are load facing, either because they serve a reliability need for load or because they will um, alleviate congestion for load. Um, we are less inclined to prioritize uh, transmission projects that are really designed to alleviate what I would view as poor generation siting decisions. So it's not that that shouldn't be you know, considered at some point, but if you're prioritizing the capital that we're gonna spend um, and customers are paying for all of it, we believe the priority should be load facing projects. Okay, so we have a uh, question from uh, Lynn Kiesling. Uh, I love Lynn. Yes, oh yeah, she's great, yeah, friend of our street. Uh, so what's a politically feasible way to get more upstream transparency and perhaps reliability oriented contracting in natural gas? Uh, and I know uh, Beth, you have a lot of thoughts about the role, the underexplored role of the natural <laughs> gas system in this. I think you probably all do, but uh, Beth, maybe we start with you. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, uh, you know, I always preface this by saying I'm a, you know, 30 plus year veteran on the electricity side, so I come with kind of a disparaging attitude toward the natural gas industry. Um, <laughs> I try to put that aside, but and I recognize the and this this situation in February really highlights the codependence of those systems and the weaknesses therein. Um, I'm I, I would like to see similar con, you know and as I dug into the, on the natural tried to get smarter on the natural gas side, what what I learn is just a, a very different inter versus intra state requirements for natural gas. Many of our power plants are on intra-state 
gas pipelines. Um, and so the kinds of FERC or federal FERC jurisdictional requirements for pipeline code of conduct and non-preferential access, all of those things that we're very familiar with on the electricity transmission side that exists for interstate gas delivery, it does not exist for intrastate. Um, even just basic information, it just the, the, the asymmetry, the, dis, the, the differences in how the, the public access to information on the different systems is, is striking, right? You want to know which power plants were out for which duration? And that's, it's on a website. You can go find that right now. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to know which compressor stations were out of power, which, you know, what was the volume of natural gas that was in the system and, you know, compared to what demands were, those kinds of volumes, I think, are helpful and would be, it, it would be important to know to help make sure we're trying to solve the right problem. Um, and so that, that's a little concerning to me, um, uh, particularly as I, you know, I see a, you know, a, a Texas legislature sort of hyper focused on on uh, on ERCOT. Let's we got to redo ERCOT. We got to redo the PUC. We got to redo electricity. Um, we got to pay for you know people to build power plants. Or what, whatever that is, uh, you know that extra capacity doesn't do you any good if one of the you know primary feeds feedstuffs is not available, and we don't we don't fully understand what its capabilities are and how that fits in. So those are my thoughts on the, how, you know, the question had to do with how political, f politically feasible it is. And I, I am, uh, I, I'm going to uh, listen to the angel on my, on my one shoulder and not say that publicly. Um, and I'll, I'll let others, uh, I'll let others opine on, on political feasibility. All right. Uh, yes, it is. I mean, it is a little, uh, you know, concerning that, you know, uh, the legislature is making some of these decisions. We don't, still entirely know what you know what the what the problems were for all the different plants uh you know fuel supply or weather issues or uh you know loss of electricity because they weren't critical designated load or whatever um what uh K katie pat do you have any uh, thoughts on this yeah, um, ERCOT put out a report to Commissioner DeAndrea last week that was made public. And, you know, a, a number of us had further questions about it, and it's, uh, it's a work in progress. But it did kind of try to aggregate the responses, because the most important, uh, well, there's three cri critical things that need to be done right now. And one of them, the, the first one is the root cause analysis for all the generator outages to find out before we go making policy and, and changing everything or failing to change some things, let's figure out what it is that really happened. So the, the story isn't yet told, but the facts are becoming clearer that you know, obviously it was a plant weatherization issue, yes. It was a gas system weatherization issue, yes. Um, I'm, I've always, kind of had a third bucket that isn't showing up on anybody's checklist, but it's on mine because it's commercial issues because there are some mismatches and Beth explained them great about the intra inter kind of commercial practices, but definitions of force majeure, they're not the same for gas supply and power to an electric plant as the electric plant has to supply power to its customers. So I got force majeure by you, but I can't force majeure my way out of a $9,000 contract with my customers. What, what kind of Alice in Wonderland world is this? Um, so yes, there, there, are, there are things that we've got to find out um, to be, sh the magnitude is still open. I was a little surprised that the number that was attributed to fuel, um, what was that word, Beth? Fuel sh uh, shortfalls or fuel? Short, yeah, I don't have it up. But, fuel but, yeah, full. Something limitations or something yeah, yeah fuel limitations that's what it was uh that that was six gigawatts instead of 10 or so that i think the texas tribune had come up with a number uh, and some uh some pretty interesting article about this failure to file a three-page form i mean my whole thing on the three-page form is it's irrelevant the wires companies should know who their customers are they know what's a critical load and what's not they can make that determination that's what we pay them the big bucks for so that can easily be done by them but 
people are still passing the buck, even in Texas. That's I, We grow up here not raised like that. I just want you folks that are from some other zip code to know our daddies and our mamas tell us to own up when we do something wrong and then the punishment will be a whole lot less. But it must be the carpetbaggers coming into Austin that didn't get the memo. But um, yeah, you, Katie's getting it every day. So she, she gets to watch that S show go all crazy all day. But, you know, that's not we'll figure it out and we need to, but we, that's right. I mean, you've got two very interdependent systems here with two separate regulators, two very separate regulatory regimes. You know, you even wonder is like, did, did you kind of back solve your, your natural gas price for your heat rate and the $9,000 price cap? I mean, we saw, we saw gas go to numbers we never saw in the California energy crisis. I mean, to, to, you know, I, 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 it looks like those are teed up for a jury to decide whether that's price gouging or not. But I'd, I'd be hard put to see a Texan that didn't think that whatever, uh, from $2 to 1100 is that what the Denton, the Denton utility guy testified to? That yeah. somewhere along that continuum doesn't trip over from being scarcity pricing into price gouging. Um, I uh, we'll get some case law on this, and that's the great thing about conflict is you get answers, and we do have a system called the courts to give us answers on what is price gouging, but that can happen again tomorrow. I mean, we don't have a real um, discipline, even though there is storage in the gas industry, which is something as a gas regulator, I always prayed we'd get in the power industry now we finally got it here but it's going to take a while to get to you know substantial levels where we could have avoided you know february but um yeah i i i uh i think beth had a lot of wisdom there and i i wish um i wish that there was the bandwidth and the and the the interest in really delving into the issues to try to solve them because there's it's a it's a wonderful part of the texas uh, economic scene uh, the oil and gas industry, and I know it's getting pilloried by ESG and you know, all this stuff, but you know, there's a there's a, a rational way to do this that doesn't result in the kind of carnage we saw happening in February. That that people that help solve problems get paid to solve them, uh, and that people that don't take steps to solve their problems get punished. I mean, a lot of that happened, but it just happened in extremes, and you know, maybe. The whole concept of what we're talking about on this call and elsewhere is the guardrails are pretty wide here. They probably need to be pulled in a little bit and let's figure out the most thoughtful ways to do that. I, I want to talk about uh, some of the pricing issues, but before I do that, we do have another question from the audience from uh, Katie Tubb with the Heritage Foundation. And she asked, she says, uh, Peter Crampton has proposed a uh, rolling 30 to 60 minute look ahead market to help improve the efficiency of the real time market. Uh, would that be a way to help uh, reward reliability and dispatchable sources? Well, I, I, I'm going to jump in because I love this question. And I, of course, I think it's a great idea because it's one I've been thinking about as well. Um, it, you know, you think about why do we have a day ahead market? Well, we have a day ahead market because we, in theory, we're making daily unit commitment decisions, right? That day ahead price helps inform, should I turn my power plant on for tomorrow or not? And that feeds into, do I nominate natural gas? You know, how do I line up my fuel? All of that. Well, as we, as we move forward to more intermittent resources and needing to react and respond to variations on a, on a, a much more rapid basis, you know, I question whether that day ahead time frame is close enough to be meaningful. Um, and so I don't know if it's 30 or 60 minutes or it's three or four hours, but, but some kind of, uh, but I have been thinking about some sort of t market clearing prior to real time after day ahead that would help with those short term commitment decisions, Com committing things like gas turbines that require you know minutes to start up not hours and and would help react and respond to potentially large variations in increases and it's not just commitments it's decommitments as well um, but increases and de decreases in intermittent output 
Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, okay. Uh, I, that said, I don't think it would have had any, it wouldn't have helped or done anything to improve the February situation. So uh, I, I need to add that tagline. Sure. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the pricing controversy. I know you know ERCOT has a nine thousand uh, dollar price cap, and during during the uh, week uh, of that Valentine's Day week, there were several actions taken uh, to kind of uh, first. I mean, I guess lock in that cap because uh, there were some sort of issues with the computerized auction system or, or what I still don't totally understand what it was and so there's there's controversy about that uh, and some of the other rule changes and then also how long it it lasted um, and you know this is something that uh, has uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, great Texas rhetoric on this I think uh, you know on on both sides of the issue uh, but you know like w what are your thoughts on uh, you know, some of those, some of those decisions by ERCOT and, and what could have been done, what, if anything, could have been done differently? I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to sit here and, you know, armchair quarterback what the uh, PUC did, because I think they were in a tough spot and they were trying to do what they thought the right thing was. But looking back on how it played out, I, I do think that it could have been handled in a lot better way. And I think we should put a framework in place going forward that is different in case we get into this kind of situation again. So I would say the fundamental thing that I think needs to change going forward is the $9,000 price is meant to be a performance incentive and an, and an investment incentive around capacity driven events. Um, and it's meant to, you know, for resources in the market, it's meant to elicit behavior, response from either customers curtailing, new additional generators committing, and ultimately, you know, investors investing additional resources in Texas. When you have something like this winter storm, where you have widespread supply chain issues, an extreme weather event across the entire state, you know, and other kind of dislocations that are preventing people from behaving the way that they normally would in response to these prices, I do not believe that it serves any legitimate economic purpose to continue sending those high price signals. You're not going to get an investment around people hoping maybe there's going to be another winter storm, Yuri blowout um, in the future. It's just not how it works. It's too unpredictable. And once it becomes clear that you're really getting the response that you're going to get and, and responses are impaired because of what I view as sort of like a force majeure event, um, I really do think we need what I've been calling an event-based circuit breaker. Um, and so what we have in ERCOT right now is we do have a circuit breaker, but it is triggered by a certain amount of overall revenues for the year. And once that trigger is met, the price cap drops to 2000 for the remainder of the year, which I think is a terrible design. Um, and we've been advocating to try to fix that because we, right now, we're at the $2,000 cap because of the revenues achieved during that week in February. So we're about to roll into a hot summer with a $2,000 performance incentive, and I'm worried about it. Um, we believe that that needs to go back up to a level that's going to incentivize performance. So, so what we would prefer to see is an event-based based circuit breaker where you kind of let things ride for a little bit, perform the people who were able to show, I mean, reward the people who were able to perform. But then once it becomes clear that you're in this kind of force majeure situation, hit that circuit breaker until the event's over. And yeah. you, you, you got to have a way for people to not lose money. Um, and so you want it to be a lower cap, but with a make whole payment for anybody whose costs were above that. Um, and you also want to set the cap at a level where you're going to cover most people's normal costs because otherwise that all gets uplifted through make whole payments. So that's the balance you're trying to strike. Um, but I think that would have avoided a lot of the financial distress from that week. And we think that would have been a much better approach. Um, the other thing that I think, I don't know how much this is being talked about, but the way that the um, adjustment to keep prices at 9,000 was implemented, 
was not clear at all from the commission's order from the dais. If it had been, I might have called in and said, no, please, God, don't do that. Um, <laughs> but they just said, let's correct for the, for the effects of the firm load shed, right? And so ERCOT took that as um, asking them to adjust this very specific adder in the market, the reliability deployment price adder. It is part of the clearing price, so you can adjust it to get to the 9,000. But the problem with it is it, that amount is also paid to anybody on the system who's providing reserves, and that gets uplifted to everybody. It's unhedgeable. Um, and normally what happens is if that adder gets really big, it's because you're in a scarcity situation, there's no reserves to pay, right? So there's this relationship, the adder gets big, nobody's getting it. But what happened in this event is by holding the prices at the cap for 9,000 on Thursday and Friday and allowing the system to accumulate a bunch of reserves, you had a big adder and a bunch of reserves that were getting paid that adder. And, and that was $1.2 billion of additional costs that I just think were completely unnecessary. And had they implemented that price adjustment in a different way, could have been avoided. So to me, that's the other big takeaway. All right. I would, uh, I would have agreement from the other panelists. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, my, I'm nodding so hard, my head hurts. So, <laughs> so Katie, Katie, when TIEC goes to the Commission of Legislature, I will go there as just Pat Wood with no position behind me other than care about the market, the circuit breaker. It just admit the fact that if you have to drop 20 gigs a load, the market's not working. Exactly. You got every price signal you couldn't. You had to take this very, yeah. very serious step. Um, I did talk to the chairman of the commission back when the 11 outages happened. And, you know, they actually had a $3,000 price cap then. <laughs> They kind of wrote it through that period of time, um, and it actually, I uh, think it started at 1.30 there as well. But it was uh, maybe, like maybe, four hours. Yeah. It was but four it went, hours. But, it, but the prices went up, and but then they started to come down before right. the load outages stopped because everybody looked ahead, as markets do, and brought the price back up. So they kind of rode through without that um having to be done but in any event you're right kate i like the way you described it let it play out a while and if it's if it's a, re a repeat of 2021 instead of 2011 let something make it into a, a circuit breaker you you kind of look at the make hole you're and i loved your caveat there because i again i'm thinking about people back solving their gas price based on the nine thousand dollar price cap and the heat rate i I think that, I mean, we had to reprice the whole markets in California for two, for 99 and uh, for 2000, when I got to FERC, that ended up being the only solution. And then, you know, politically it was the manipulation issue showed up afterwards. So it was a mess. So I can tell you repricing a market is awful. I had to do re I had to reprice four months of a market, nine months after the fact. So it was mm -hmm. way messier than what they were talking about here last month. But in any event, I don't wish that on anybody. Um, it's hard to do. There's no equity uh, for anybody, and it creates a very dark call on the market um, going forward that you would have political intervention um, in, the, in a way that we had to do. And I, uh, I, re I don't regret doing it, but I, I also want to make damn sure we don't ever have to do that in Texas. And uh, we got really close with, with having that out of market uh, action that the commission felt like they had to take. And again, I'm with Katie. I'm not going to sec I'm not going to quarterback that one because uh, I've been in that seat and it's a pretty hot seat already. But um, yeah, I, I uh, desired your question was kind of what would you do? I, I would definitely make sure we have a clear circuit breaker process in place that is is really set up for those absolute moments that you know Deanne Shelley and Arthur had on the night of the 15th on the afternoon of the 15th that it's just the ERCOT saying we're not getting people responding to the price signals we're not the mar the form was not working you know those kind of things are critical but let's have a pro process in place that not only uh, prevents that but address is ready just to pull out the shelf to implement and then the make whole provision so that people that do do the right thing don't go out there and buy expensive gas, just be scarcity pricing and not gouging. So that's a real price. So you got to pay that to keep the lights on. It's important. So I pay that person what they did, but uh, that doesn't become the clearing price for everybody else. Yeah. Make holes actually end up a lot cheaper than market clearing price. Even 
we didn't do a lot of make coal in California, but we had a market clearing price that was based on an imputed gas price and an imputed heat rate. And then anything that kind of was above that, they got made whole plus 10% or something like that. So yeah. th you can do it. Um, it's, uh, and, and hopefully we won't be in this position again, because we'll have done all the other problems that we really haven't talked about a lot, but like weatherization, uh, scenario planning, you know, twice a year drills on winter and summer peak. A lot of these good ideas, got more communication to the public. There's communication this week. Uh, for conservation, you just watch that curve after that story's hit the news. It just, people, because they lived through it recently, they conserved really quick. I don't know if that was the complete explanation, but you know, this public communication aspect, you know, we worry more about uh, old people who've got dementia driving around a, a Toyota Tundra in Plano, Texas, <laughs> than we do about a storm that's gonna knock out the whole state for four days um, on the on the, the highway signs. Exactly. I'd love to get that fixed, but, and they will. I, that's in the statute and I'm thrilled they're gonna, they're taking a lot of the common sense stuff. So I'm actually kind of relieved the legislature's folks on all the right things that I would if I were in their shoes. I just wanna make sure that when we get into these really impactful ones that can control future investment and customer bills that we let a kind of a little bit of time and, and discussion and smart people and, and that kind of tug of war that the commission is so good at hosting happen uh, to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, you know, Kate, Katie and Pat may not want to throw anybody under the bus, but I, you know, I'll tell you that Monday night when I read that first order sitting in my cold, dark uh, house, reading it on my phone, I, 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 sure I said out loud to no one here, uh, what the F are they doing? Um, that uh, the suspension of LCAP, um, it, just the suspension until the next regularly scheduled open meeting um, seemed to be a lack of awareness. And, and I've likened it to, uh, you know, old timey uh, fuses in the fuse box, right? They replaced the fuse with a penny and, the, and our financial house is kind of burned down, right? The, the volume of dollars that have resulted from that decision are, are, are just uh, are immense. And we still don't quite have our arms around what, what the impacts of that will be. I, I agree that an event-based kind of circuit breaker is, is appropriate. And in fact, you know, our energy only market design was, you know, fairly heavily lifted from the Australian market. And they do have, they use an event-based um, uh, circuit breaker. It's price-based on, uh, on a rolling basis. Um, the other aspect that I've, I've been thinking about, you know, somebody who's been around long enough for these winter events, winter is different than summer. And, you know, and maybe we just need to think, in, you know, on the electricity side, just be prepared for doing things differently in the winter than we would in the summer. Um, you know, being quicker to, you know, sort of suspend market activity, everybody do everything they can, it's winter time, you know, we don't want people to freeze, the magnitude, the potential harm um, seems so much worse than summer peak, which is where we focus most of our time and attention and, 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 and think about and, you know, time, attention, incentives are focused on the summer. Um, and that you have the ability to kind of ride things out in the summertime, the sun goes down, it gets cooler, we can react, respond, you know, it's just, it, it's not the same issues that we're dealing with. And, and I, so two things. One, I think, as an industry, I think we really need to kind of bifurcate or separate our thinking about summer peak versus these rare but more impactful winter events. Yep. That's one aspect. The second aspect, as evidenced by sort of choices made through through the that February week, you know, as a again as an industry, we have really good practices, policies, procedures for getting into emergency conditions. You know certain things happen and we escalate our emergency condition, we rarely have an effective way of backing out of the emergency condition. And I can point to a variety of situations where that, the decisions made on the backside are more impactful and less well thought out. And so I would challenge all of us to think about 
what does that look like? What are the criteria for stepping out of emergency conditions and back into sort of more normal market operations? Because I think there's, there's lessons to learn there and we, we continue to do that poorly. So uh, we're almost at time, but I did want to ask uh, a little bit about the demand side of things. You know, there's been a lot of understandable attention played to the supply side, uh, but you know, on the demand side, uh, Pat, you mentioned you know there are some things like uh, calls for conservation and whatnot, but uh, there's not a lot of uh, price signals uh, in the market. Uh, you know, on the demand side, unless you're a gritty customer and you get like a $15,000 bill. Uh, so what do we think, it, what can be done to try to, uh, you know, further, further deal with that? I know I have, a, I have a relative who they rode out the storm. They're actually in Palm Springs uh, just for a va vacation. They never lost power. Uh, whereas, you know, other people that I know, including Beth, you know, were, were out for, for days and days. Um, so I, I don't know anybody if they have thoughts on this on this topic. Well, I'm a gritty. I was a gritty customer until Friday afternoon. Before that, I got um, uh, ironically on February 1st, I got an email that said, "Coming soon, our price protection program coming March the 1st." So it was basically a you, I, don't, I don't know what the number was, but it's like 75 cents or a dollar per megawatt hour would be the cap. And then they do catastrophic insurance over that, which is exactly what you need to do. So I voted for that back in September after the summer spikes last year, they did a poll of their customers and I voted for that one. So it took them a while to get around to it, but that was a day, a, a day late and a dollar short for that one. But I did switch and I was lucky to switch, but you know, I did switch to a free nights program. So I still like this time of use concept where I'm incentivized to get my load off the grid when the grid needs it most. Now, it just so happened that wouldn't have saved me here. Uh, and it did because I I was at nine kilowatts whenever the, the lights went out because I saw we, we made the all time winter peak on Valentine's night and I went to bed and boom, it all happened in the middle of the night. But, you know, generally in for summer peaking and for most of the time, if you get people off the load in the middle of the day, you're, you're probably doing the grid a favor. But I do love real time pricing. I do hate that Gritty's made a poster child here and we're all going to just retreat back into our annual average rates of eight cents or 10 cents or whatever everybody's paying and get zero signal that, you know, damn it, guys, the grid is really stressed out now. We need to help them, not just get the calls on the radio for conservation, but get that little beep on your phone that, hey, it's $9 a kilowatt hour right now. You need to turn stuff off. That would have probably wouldn't have saved none of these things alone would have saved the grid, but that could have been a nice one. Uh, Katie. Well, and it's, yeah. well, I was going to say, and it's that customer, it's that demand reaction. I, it, you know, I continue to hold out hope that we'll actually see in these electricity markets, the intersection of real demand and supply, but getting demand more active and engaged in, and making decisions that are in their best interest and everyone's best interest for the grid. And, and you do that through pricing. Um, yeah. Now, would that, that, that it's one thing to, you know, curtail or shut off your cycle, your air conditioning for a little bit. It's another thing to turn your heat off. And that I yeah. think is the challenge with these winter events. Um, we made, I don't think we ever, I don't think we really know what the load could have been um, in this winter event. So that's a. Yeah, I know we're short on time, but just real quick, I've actually been thinking a lot about this because like Pat, I, I hate to see um, you know, the idea of more time of use rates for residentials get thrown out because I really think long term that's a big part of the equation. You just get almost no response to price once you get down to the kind of residential small commercial customer level. I think what's going to have to happen is somebody needs to make a product or an offering. I think the reps are going to be challenged to come up with ways to um, financially incentivize that kind of performance for, from their customers uh, in a way that doesn't expose them to the market directly. So it's going to kind of be 
coming at it from the opposite direction, which is like they're going to pay a fixed price all the time. But then if they're able to provide certain capabilities, they would get a payment as opposed to like my clients, they just turn off and avoid the payment. Somebody's going to have to, you know, come up with offerings that rationalize that a little bit more for these customers. So I'm hoping that 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 that's still something that the market will keep working on developing. But it's a big part of the equation going forward, and and I hope that that doesn't get lost with all the changes that are going on. All right. Well, I think on that note, we are at time. I want to thank uh, Beth, Pat, Katie. I know that you are all very busy. Uh, so thank you very much for joining uh, and enlightening us with your perspectives. And uh, thank you to the audience uh, for tuning in. Goodbye. Great. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Yes.